Hey everyone, I'm Dr. Michael Bruce, the sleep doctor. You know, one of the biggest advancements in sleep diagnosis is the at-home sleep apnea test. If a doctor suspects you of a sleep disorder, this is increasingly becoming the first option. So rather than spending the night in the sleep lab hooked up to all of those wires, instead, you can take this test in the comfort of your own home. All this requires a sensor for your chest, one for your finger, and then this piece that you wear like a wristwatch. Now, I wanted to show you what an at-home sleep test tracks and the kinds of information that it looks at. So I thought I would go through this with you so you can see exactly what your doctor would be looking at. Now, one thing I should say is that these devices are almost exclusively designed to test for sleep apnea. If your doctor suspects any other sleep disorder like narcolepsy, restless leg syndrome, or even periodic limb movements, then unfortunately that may mean a night in the sleep lab. All right, so the first thing I like to pay attention to is my total sleep time. Now, what is it that we're actually measuring? We're measuring from the time your eyes close and actually fall asleep to when they open for the day. As a general guideline, we need enough data to be able to make a diagnosis, and that's gonna probably run somewhere between five and a half and six hours. Looking at this, this patient went from 11.30 to 7.50 and got a total of six hours and 37 minutes, which gives us just enough time for the data. So the next thing that I like to work, look at is the amount of time somebody spends awake. Um, if you go down to the last page, you can see the sleep stages by chart, and we can see that wake up, almost 20% of the night was spent in wake. So this person definitely seems to have some issues with waking up multiple times. It looks like they fell asleep in roughly 29 minutes. That's about average. So I'm not thinking narcolepsy where they would fall asleep in two minutes, and I'm not thinking insomnia where it might take them all night to fall asleep. The next thing I wanna look at are, is snoring. Snoring turns out to be kind of a big deal for a lot of people out there. It looks like there was 116 minutes of snoring here, roughly 30% of sleep. So when you say that much snoring, you start to wonder, could there be somebody having something called sleep apnea, which is really the next thing that we're going to take a look at. When I take a look at the data there, is there something called a PRDI and a PAHI? PRDI means the Respiratory Disturbance Index. So that's all the times that somebody wakes up having anything to do with something from their breathing. That's what we're really interested in. So it turned out that this happened 203 times a night, roughly giving us per hour, roughly 31 times per hour. Now that is a bigger number than what we normally see in terms of looking for disease. We really like to look at the PAHI number. Um, there, there, that person had 133 episodes or 20 times an hour. Now here's the deal. If you've got sleep apnea, you would be diagnosed with mild sleep apnea anywhere from five to 15 times an hour, from 15 to 30 times an hour is moderate, and 30 and above is severe. So in this case, we would say that this individual stopped breathing in their sleep 20.4 times an hour. That's quite a few when you start to think about it. I mean, and if alarm clock went off like every five minutes, which would be 20 times an hour, how good of a sleep would you really be getting? Kind of a fair question to ask. There's another area that's of importance as well, and this has to do with the oxygen saturation. So when we look over on the same page, we see that on average, this person had a 95 um, oxygen saturation. Anything above 90 is great, but there was a minimum where that person dropped down to, uh, it appears as though 87. When people go below 90, we're concerned that they could have a stroke or could have a heart attack. The good news is, is when we look deep into that data, we can see across the oxygen saturation here on the third block down that there were only a few small times when this dropped below 90. However, they're definitely something to be thinking about and something to be of concern. The final thing we really want to try to figure out is, well, could this have something to do with the position that the person is sleeping in? When we're looking at body position here, we try to look at what's going on when people are specifically in the supine position or lying on their back. You can see that in the last half of the night here, almost all of the respiratory events and snoring occurred when this person was on their back. So we see that happen on their back or when they're prone, meaning on their stomach. So if this person moved to their side, we would see almost the majority of their snoring disappear. We might also see a majority of their apnea disappear. So this could be potentially considered a case of positional sleep apnea, where the person has a tendency to have it on their back or on their stomach, but not necessarily on their side. In this case, we might think about using something called a CPAP machine 
but we also might consider a positioner, which means with something that forces people to sleep on their side. A few more things to think about while we're kind of looking through these data are the sleep stages. It turns out that while sleeping and having this many respiratory events, this individual had a very small amount of deep sleep, only 6%. Normally we would see about 25%. And REM sleep, only 7%. Again, normally we would see about 25%. We are seeing 86% light sleep, which is way too much, which is again is another indicator that this person could be having a respiratory disturbance or something like sleep apnea. As a general guideline, I like to use CPAP machine first. That doesn't mean I leave people on CPAP forever, but we know that CPAP works 99% of the time. So when we're doing something like that, we can put somebody on, have them get relief immediately, and then decide, hey, what's the long-term treatment of something like this? I wanna be clear about something. Once you're diagnosed with sleep apnea, it's pretty rare for it to just magically disappear. And so anything we can do to keep the pipe as open as possible is gonna be quite helpful. But once again, there are a whole host of different options and treatments for sleep apnea. I've actually shot videos on all of these different uh, treatment modalities, and I hope you get a chance to check them out as well. But if you are suspected of having sleep apnea, it can be a major boost to your mental, emotional, and physical health if you get it fixed. Thanks everyone for watching. This is Dr. Michael Bruce, The Sleep Doctor, wishing you sweet dreams.